So here's something I love about Star Trek, the original series, that the later shows don't do nearly so often. When the Enterprise randomly shows up at a planet and there's just something weird going on. Maybe it's something weird that just started happening. Maybe it's been happening for centuries. Whatever the case may be, Captain Kirk gets there and he's like, nope, no, don't like this. And the crew gets tangled up in the weirdness. Then they escape. Then Kirk does something to radically alter this alien society, gives a quick inspiring speech, and flies away on his spaceship, chuckling with his buddies, while that civilization he just destabilized careens headlong toward total collapse. Or maybe it doesn't. We don't know. We don't care. What's on for next week? Sometimes the planet of the week isn't just any planet. There's an extra layer of weirdness laid on top because Kirk and his crew beam down to discover that this planet is strangely, uncannily, impossibly similar to... Earth! These parallel or alternate or duplicate Earths, whatever you want to call them, are never very nice places, and there are more than a few of them. There are enough of them, in fact, to make it worth asking, what is actually Star Trek's worst parallel Earth? Star Trek parallel Earth stories aren't found only in the original series. Depending on how broadly we define the concept, almost every series in the franchise has told them. But the original series depicted parallel Earths the most directly and the most frequently. The first time the crew of the Enterprise encountered a planet that bore an eerie resemblance to Earth, they were baffled. It was a mystery, a reminder of how big and unknowable and unexpectedly strange the universe is. By the end of the series, it had <laughs> happened so often, they barely even noticed when they found another one. Looks like another parallel development, Captain, Spock would say, as though he wasn't sure whether he should bother mentioning it or not. The first parallel Earth visited by Captain Kirk and his crew is seen in the episode Miri from about a quarter of the way through Classic Trek's first season. The planet on which this episode is set is an exact duplicate of Earth. Same size, same atmosphere, same continents. It's literally a second Earth. When they beam down, our heroes discover a neglected, crumbling town similar to towns on Earth in the 20th century. The planet is populated by humans, all of whom are children, one of whom is Miri, who has the hots for Captain Kirk, which is even more uncomfortable than it would be ordinarily because she's both a prepubescent child and hundreds of years old. Really good at finding that sweet spot of, ugh, aren't you, Star Trek? It turns out that centuries ago, scientists on this duplicate Earth who were trying to develop a way of prolonging life had unwittingly unleashed a virus that killed all the adults. The children left behind were granted a much longer lifespan, but were also doomed to go insane and die once they reached puberty. Working against the clock, the landing party has contracted the virus and all of them except Spock are dying from it, Dr. McCoy is able to find a cure, saving not only himself and his crewmates, but the children of this tragic world. The planet we see in Miri isn't the worst parallel Earth Star Trek has to show us, but the fact that it is described as an exact copy of Earth makes it one of my favorites. It's an example of a kind of weirdness that the franchise lost after TOS, and in my opinion, that it could use more of. Much of what makes classic Trek so fun and interesting, especially in comparison to the shows that followed it, is the heedless, made-up-as-it-goes-along quality it has. The ship randomly finds a planet just like Earth. Sure, why the hell not? Should we even try to explain it? Why would we do that? The whole thing is just... Miri's duplicate Earth is usually referred to as Earth 2. Hey, does that mean the original Batman lives there? Oh, wait, he would have been killed by that virus. <laughs> He's dead. Anyway, Earth 2 is identical to our Earth, what we egocentric humans would almost certainly call the real Earth, because its physical, biological, and sociological evolution followed paths that were identical to those followed by our Earth. It's the most extreme example of what would eventually be called Hodgkin's Law of Parallel Planetary Development. But it's not the only one. We find another product of Hodgkin's Law near the end of Season 2 in the episode The Omega Glory. 
The Enterprise finds the starship Exeter abandoned in orbit above planet Omega-4. Aboard the ship, they find white crystals scattered around seemingly discarded Starfleet uniforms. Dr. McCoy deduces that these crystals are actually the remains of the crew. They are what is left of a human body when all the water is extracted. Spock finds the final log recorded by the Exeter's chief medical officer, who says, Hey, so, uh, bad news, if you're watching this aboard the Exeter, you've got the same thing that killed everybody here, so if you don't want to die, you should beam straight down to the planet's surface, because that's your only chance. And Kirk's like, let's go. Down on the planet, they find Captain Tracy, commanding officer of the Exeter. He explains that his ship arrived here on a survey mission, and he stayed behind to negotiate with some of the natives while the rest of his landing party returned to the ship. When they got back to the ship, they realized they'd contracted some kind of disease on the planet, and before they all figured out that the planet afforded protection against the disease, they were all dead. Damn, the planet in Miri had a disease, too. Why are all these duplicate Earths carrying diseases that kill you in outlandishly cruel ways? Like, you don't just develop a cough that gradually gets worse until you can't breathe or something. You go insane and die when you hit puberty or lose all the water in your body and turn into crystals. If you ever visit a parallel Earth, don't forget to wash your hands. I feel like that's the central message of Star Trek really. So, Captain Tracy has been hanging out with this tribe of natives called the Kams. They're pretty cool, but they're at war with this other tribe called the Yangs. Oh, and it turns out Tracy isn't so much hanging out with the Kams as leading them and using his phaser to help them fight off the Yangs, which is a massive Prime Directive violation. So massive that even Kirk, who typically treats the Prime Directive as a mildly offered suggestion, is like... Dude, no. But Tracy doesn't take criticism so well. He kills Kirk's red shirt and lies to the Enterprise about the condition of the landing party, saying that they've been affected by the disease and are feverish and delirious. Kirk tells Tracy that he's under arrest for doing a thing Kirk's done a bunch of times and never been arrested for, but this isn't about him, okay? And Tracy's like, don't you want to know why I violated the Prime Directive? If only so you can compare it with the reasons you violated it all those times? It's because the people who live on this planet never get sick. And as a result of that, they live for hundreds of years. This planet is the fountain of youth. As a planet. The planet of youth. Tracy puts McCoy to work researching the life-extending properties of the planet in order to develop a serum that will allow others to live longer, but McCoy figures out that the longer lifespans of the people on Omega-4, as well as the natural elements that provide protection against the disease that killed the Exeter crew, are the result of evolution following the release of a powerful biological weapon in the distant past. A few hours on the planet will cure you of the disease that killed the Exeter's crew, but the anti-aging effect is specific to these people and this place. It can't be bottled and distributed. While McCoy has been figuring this out, Kirk and Spock have been locked up with a couple of Yangs, one of whom escapes and runs off to rally the rest of his tribe to attack. Tracy demands that Kirk call the Enterprise and have them send down some more phasers, but Sulu doesn't go for it, so Kirk and Tracy have a fight instead. The Yangs show up, capture Kirk, Spock, McCoy, and Tracy, and take them back to their territory. And that's where the true nature of this particular parallel Earth reveals itself. When they're brought before the chief of the Yangs, the guy who escaped earlier, it turns out, Kirk and Spock, with the help of some truly Olympian leaps of logic, deduce that Yangs is a bastardization of Yankees, and Coms, the tribe Captain Tracy was with, is short for Communists. And furthermore, the Americans of this planet, the Yankees, and the Communists, specifically those in Southeast Asia, or whatever the equivalent is on this planet, must have fought a terrible war against each other that wiped out most of the population, leaving only the ancestors of the modern-day Yangs and Comps. Kirk and Spock's conclusions are confirmed a few minutes later when the Yangs whip out an American flag, a Bible, and one of those copies of the Constitution that they sell in the gift shop at the National Archives. So, not only did these people independently draft a Constitution identical to ours, 
They also merchandised it just like we did. That is some impressive parallel development. The universe is truly a pantheon of wonders. Once they figure out what the deal is with the Yangs and the comms, and once Kirk convinces them not to kill Spock, they think he's the devil for a few minutes, Kirk reads out the preamble of the Constitution and tells the Yangs that its ideas about liberty and justice have to apply to everyone, including their enemies, the comms, or else they mean nothing. Once that's settled, Kirk's like, come on, let's do that thing where we leave the society we just radically altered and never return. And then they do that thing. The parallel Earths presented in Miri and the Omega Glory have a lot in common with each other, apart from the obvious, which they also have in common with our Earth. Both parallel Earths followed identical paths of evolution to ours, but then diverged sharply after a global catastrophe. On both planets, the catastrophe involved an artificially created virus that wiped out most of the population, and both viruses had effects related to greatly increasing the natural human lifespan. The biggest difference between the two planets is that the world we see in Miri doesn't really have to be a duplicate Earth for the episode to work. If the Enterprise found a planet full of centuries-old children where all the adults had died of a virus that kills people once they reach puberty that wasn't a carbon copy of Earth, the story would have been the same. The duplicate Earth angle is just a kooky added detail. But in the Omega Glory, the duplicate Earth angle is very much an integral part of the story. It matters that this is a parallel Earth, and that the Yangs and the Comms are descendants of Americans and Asian communists, because the message of the episode depends on that. The episode is one of a few cautionary tales produced by Star Trek The Original Series about the Vietnam War, which was ongoing at the time the show was produced. The Yangs and the Comms of Omega-4 are the only survivors of their Earth's human population because their Yankees and Communists couldn't find a peaceful solution to their conflict. They attacked each other with devastating weapons and destroyed each other. That message loses some of its impact when the episode goes on to imply that the way to resolve the conflict is for everyone to abide by the principles of the U.S. Constitution. Wasn't it Western powers trying to impose our preferred form of government on other parts of the world that got us into the whole Vietnam mess in the first place? But, if nothing else, it's a helpful reminder that, as wonderful as Star Trek is, it's still very much a product of the time and the culture in which it was made. Not every parallel Earth visited by the crew of the Enterprise during the original series is a post-apocalyptic dystopia contaminated by an artificially created virus that makes everyone it doesn't kill immortal. Some of the most memorable ones are theme planets. For instance, take Sigma Iosia II from the episode A Piece of the Action, a world better known as the Gangster Planet. The Enterprise arrives at Sigma Iosha 2 in response to a report sent by the starship Horizon a hundred years ago, a report Starfleet only recently received because it was sent by a conventional radio, and the Horizon was lost with all hands shortly after visiting Sigma Iosha 2. Kirk speaks to an Iosian leader, a man named Oxmix, and they agree on a time and place for a landing party to beam down and finally follow up on the Horizon's visit. Kirk and Spock and McCoy transport to the planet's surface and find themselves on the street of what looks like a mid-20th century American city. Spock notices that everyone seems to be carrying firearms. Like an early 21st century American city, am I right? <laughs> My country is a death cult. After marveling at their surroundings for a few moments, they are greeted by a pair of Tommy gun-wielding 1920s gangsters who politely escort them under threat of death to see Boss Oxmix. On the way, there's a shooting that kills one of the gangsters. When it's over, everyone on the street just kind of shrugs it off and goes back to whatever they were doing. Gee, that sounds familiar, huh? Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are taken to Oxmix's office, where they find a book, the book, actually, according to Oxmix, a book about organized crime in Chicago in the 1920s. Oxmuk tells them that the book was left behind a hundred years ago by the Horizon. Our heroes realize that the Iotians, described as a highly imitative people, have patterned their entire civilization to resemble what they read about in the book. 
a society where, as Kirk puts it, conventional government broke down and the gangs took over. So the Iotians are like the Thermians. <laughs> Imagine how different Galaxy Quest would have been if, instead of a cheesy sci-fi adventure show, the Thermians had been watching like the Untouchables. They show up to Earth in a fleet of spaceships modeled after a 1931 Buick looking for Robert Stack because they need his help ridding their home planet of reptilian mobsters led by Boss Saris. <laughs> and at first, Stack is reluctant to help because he's like, I played Elliot Ness back in the 60s. I resent being typecast like this. I can do other things. And then he gets a call from his agent who wants to see if he'll do a 14th season of Unsolved Mysteries. And he turns to the Thermians like, okay, I'll do it. And that's what happened to Robert Stack in 2003. He didn't die. He left Earth with the Thermians to go fight crime in outer space. Why am I wearing a Star Trek shirt in a video about an Untouchables-themed reboot of Galaxy Quest? Seems random. Anyway, Oxmix confiscates the landing party's phasers and demands that Kirk supply him with enough of these fancy heaters to take out all the rival mobs and assume control of the entire planet. Kirk's like, nah, I don't think so. So Oxmix sends Kirk, Spock, and McCoy away while he takes one of their communicators and calls the Enterprise. Scotty, left in command while Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are gone, answers the phone, and Oxmix tells him that he has eight hours to send down a hundred of those fancy heaters. Scotty's like, what's a heater? Don't play dumb with me. Just make with the goods or it's curtains for your friends. What are curtains? Kirk, Spock, and McCoy escape from Oxmix's guards after Kirk distracts them with a convoluted made-up card game because gangsters are dumb. Before long, they're all captured again, Kirk running afoul of rival mobster Krako before ending up back at Oxmix's place, where they overpower Oxmix's men again. Kirk and Spock change clothes with two of Oxmix's goons and head back to Krakow's place. It's a good thing all the leaders of the most important territories on the gangster planet live in the same city a few blocks from each other, huh? Kirk tells Krakow that the Federation is moving in and taking over. Krakow doesn't like that, so Kirk calls Scotty aboard the Enterprise and has Krakow beamed up. Then they go back to Oxmix's place. Kirk has Scotty beam Krakow down here and locate all the other crime bosses on the planet and beam them to Oxmix's office too. Once everyone is here, Kirk informs them of his plan for the Federation to take control. Oxmix will run the show with Krakow as his second-in-command, and the rival gangs will stop attacking and killing each other, or else they'll have to deal with the Federation. Kirk demonstrates the power of the Federation by having the Enterprise blast an entire block of the city with its phasers set to stun, knocking everyone on the street unconscious. The bosses agree to Kirk's offer and to pay the Federation a 40% cut of all their action, which Starfleet will return to collect every year. Later, back aboard the Enterprise, Kirk justifies his actions by proposing that the Federation's 40% cut of the Iotians' mob revenue be used to help guide the Iotians away from organized crime and into a more ethical system. Then McCoy confesses that he left his communicator behind on the planet, a mistake which could eventually be an even greater source of cultural contamination than the gangster book left by the Horizon, because if the Iotians disassemble the communicator, they'll be able to figure out how Federation technology works. But Kirk just blows that off with a joke, because he's so far past giving a shit about corrupting other people's cultures that he couldn't possibly have responded any other way. The gangster planet differs from the duplicate Earths of Miri and the Omega Glory in that the similarities of its society to a society from our Earth are not the result of parallel evolution, but of contamination after an encounter with people from our Earth. There's another duplicate Earth I'm going to talk about in a few minutes that also fits that description, but a bit earlier in the second season of TOS, there was an episode featuring a theme planet that is the product of parallel evolution. Damn, Season 2 of TOS was truly the year of the theme planet, wasn't it? Anyway, the episode I'm talking about is Bread and Circuses, the show where our heroes visit the Roman Empire planet. The gimmick of the duplicate Earth in this episode is that it has reached a level of development equivalent to that of our Earth during the 20th century, but the Roman Empire never fell. So they have cars and mass communication and other forms of technology typical of the mid-20th century, 
But they also have emperors and slavery and a religious minority who are the equivalent of first century Christians called the children of the sun. So, grandkids? There are also televised gladiator fights. And this becomes a problem for our heroes when they discover that the crew of the damaged Federation merchant ship, the SS Beagle, beamed down to the surface of the planet six years ago and have been forced to compete in the gladiator games. When Kirk beams down to look for more survivors, he finds the former captain of the Beagle, his old friend R.M. Merrick, has joined the Romans and been made Lord of the Games, meaning he's now in charge of the gladiator contests, where his former crew members have been fighting and dying. Not cool, man. Proconsul Claudius Marcus, a powerful Roman official, orders Kirk to have the crew of the Enterprise beamed down to the planet as well, because Claudius doesn't want any other planets to learn of his world's existence. Kirk says no, so Claudius sends Spock and McCoy to fight with the gladiators. This fails to persuade Kirk to cooperate, and Spock and McCoy survive their gladiator fights, so Claudius tries another tactic, sending his slave Drusilla to fuck Kirk. Kirk's like, this is absolutely disgusting. I take great moral offense to the concept of slavery, and I am appalled at this brazen attempt to compel my cooperation by forcing a woman to use her body in such an exploitative manner. This is outrageous. I am outraged. But as long as you're here, we might as well have sex. Later, Claudius is like, I hope you enjoyed that sweet slave trim, Kirk, because now I'm going to have you executed. But before that can happen, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy escape, and with help from Merrick, who turns babyface right before being killed by Claudius, Scotty is able to lock on to their communicator signal and beam them safely back aboard the Enterprise. Unlike most of the other Parallel Earth episodes, Kirk leaves the Roman Empire planet without fundamentally altering their society or even attempting to. He, Spock, and McCoy just barely make it back to the ship alive. But in the episode's final moments, they do muse about the existence of that Christian-like religious cult and how they might be destined to replace the Roman Empire on this planet, just as Christianity eventually replaced our Roman Empire. So I guess Kirk figures, eh, this civilization is going to collapse on its own sooner or later. Why exert myself? So, as you can probably tell by now, whether they are the product of improbable parallel development or cultural contamination, the one thing these duplicate Earths have in common is they're all kind of shitty. But what of our titular question? What is actually Star Trek's worst parallel Earth? Is it Miri's world? Omega-4? The gangster planet? The Roman Empire planet? No! I say to you that it is none of these for my money which still exists in TOS, because the writers hadn't really thought about that yet, the worst parallel Earth in Star Trek is the one we see in an episode from Season 2. Season 2! I'm telling you, if you come to Star Trek for the wacky theme planets, this is your season. Anyway, I'm talking about an episode titled Patterns of Force. The Enterprise is on its way to the planet Echos to search for John Gill, a famed historian and Federation cultural observer who has been out of contact for a while. Uh, okay, sorry to jump back out of the summary so soon, but they've all seen this movie a couple of times by now. They show up in a solar system they've never been to before looking for lost Starfleet people. They have to know that when they beam down to this planet where the lost Starfleet person went, it's going to be bad, right? They have to know that. Actually, they start to suspect something is wrong before they even reach the planet when someone from Echos launches a nuclear missile at them. They blow it up with phasers before it gets too close, but Spock points out that the last time he checked, the Ecosians didn't have anywhere near that level of technology. Kirk's like, okay, here we go. Kirk and Spock change into street clothes and beam down to the capital city just in time to see this guy, Isaac, getting beaten up and arrested by some Nazis. That's right, Nazis. It's Nazi world. That's the worst parallel Earth. Of course it is. It's a planet of Nazis. Kirk is appalled and also baffled. He says to Spock, an alien culture on another planet somehow developing its own Nazis with the same uniforms and symbols and everything? The odds of this must be astronomical. And Spock's like, yeah, it's virtually impossible. 
But on the other hand, we've seen it like half a dozen times just this year, so... There's a video screen nearby, and it's tuned to the Nazi channel, or as we called it when I was growing up, A&E. And Kirk and Spock see an official broadcast which informs them that the Fuhrer of this Nazi planet is John Gill, the Federation cultural observer they came to find. How unforeseen. Kirk's like, that's funny, back when he was my teacher at Starfleet Academy, he wasn't a Nazi. I don't think. Before they have a chance to think about it too much, Kirk and Spock are menaced by one of the Nazi soldiers, who takes them for Zeons, the persecuted minority who take the place of the Jews on this planet. They knock this Nazi out, and Spock puts on his uniform, then they walk around the corner, find another Nazi, Spock neck pinches him, Kirk takes his uniform, and they're like, let's go talk to John Gill, this shit is so easy. Then, when they're on their way into Nazi headquarters, they run into this Nazi major, and he looks at Spock and says, hey, take off your helmet. Uh-oh. So they're busted, they get taken to Nazi jail, that's a jail run by Nazis, not a jail where you put Nazis, where they're whipped and interrogated. The Nazis are like, who are you? Where'd you come from? Why are his ears like that? But Kirk and Spock are like, piss off, Nazi. And the Major is like, whoa, just because I don't agree with you about everything, I'm a Nazi? Who's really the intolerant one here? They don't tell that Nazi shit, so they get thrown in a cell. Isaac, the Zeon guy they saw get arrested when they first beamed down, is locked up in the next cell, and when Kirk and Spock escape a few minutes later by using some Star Trek shit, they take Isaac with them. Isaac leads them to the research laboratory where their communicators have been taken. The communicators have been disassembled, but Spock gathers them up so he can hopefully put them back together eventually, and they can call the Enterprise for help. They knock out a couple more Nazis, change into their uniforms, and sneak out of the building. It turns out Isaac is a member of the underground resistance, and he takes Kirk and Spock to their secret hiding place in the sewers. Spock finds a quiet spot to put one of the communicators back together, but the Enterprise is too far out of range for it to work yet. Luckily, the Resistance members help Spock and Kirk pass the time by putting on a little play for them, where Nazis show up and kill one of the Zeons, only for it to turn out that the Nazis are actually members of the Resistance, and they just wanted to make sure Kirk and Spock were really on their side. The Zeon they killed stands up and he's like, I'm okay! One of the Nazis who show up at the Resistance hideout is Daris, who's recently been decorated by the party as a hero of the Fatherland, so she's kind of having a moment. Kirk, Spock, Isaac, and Daris hatch a plan to get back inside the Nazi headquarters, where the Fuhrer is supposed to be giving a speech tonight. They show up at headquarters, disguised as a film crew following Daris around. I love how even the camera Kirk is using has a little swastika sticker on it. I hate Nazis, but you gotta hand it to them. They understand the importance of branding. I mean, like, in terms of marketing and design, not, you know, branding. I, I guess they probably did that, too. They were the worst people ever. Hey, where was I? Everybody gathers around a monitor to watch the Fuhrer's speech. The Fuhrer is here, but he's going to speak on camera from a booth, not live in front of people, and none of the Nazis think there's anything sus about that because, and I can't stress this enough, most Nazis are dumber than a sack of bricks. The Fuhrer comes on the screen and announces that in a few minutes they're going to start a holocaust against the Zeons. That's not good, but Kirk is still having a hard time believing his old buddy John Gill is actually the Fuhrer of a Nazi planet. He notices that Gill's mouth didn't seem to be moving during the speech, and wonders if maybe he's been drugged or something. Luckily, the Enterprise is in range now, so they sneak off to a closet so Kirk can use that communicator Spock reassembled to call the ship and have them throw a Nazi uniform on Dr. McCoy and beam him down to see if he can figure out what's wrong with John Gill. The Nazis detect the communicator signal and catch everybody hiding in the closet, but they draw on their improv training to convince the Nazis that Nazi Dr. McCoy is drunk, and they dragged him into the closet to keep him from embarrassing the Fuhrer on his big night. When that's over with, they sneak into the booth, and sure enough, there's the Fuhrer, so stoned he doesn't even know anyone else is there. McCoy gives him a shot of wake-up juice, and he comes around enough for Kirk to ask him, So what's the deal with all the Nazi shit, man? 
And Gil groggily explains that when he arrived on Echos, the people were divided. He took the example of Nazi Germany and tried to recreate it without the cruelty. But pretty soon, his second-in-command, Melikon, who was more of the let's try it with the cruelty persuasion, took over, drugged him, and used the power of the regime to persecute the Zayans. Gil pulls himself together long enough to give another speech, canceling the attacks on the Zayans and denouncing Melikon as a traitor. The other Nazis turn on Melikon, but Melikon grabs a machine gun and fires into the booth, mortally wounding Gil. Then Isaac kills Melikon. In the broadcast booth, Gil lies dying in Kirk's arms. I was wrong, he says. Even historians fail to learn from history. We repeat the same mistakes. Isaac, Darris, and this guy, Enig, a high-ranking Nazi who is also a secret member of the underground, step up and say that they'll go on the air to let everyone know what went down and, quote, offer a new way for our people a new way which presumably will include not being Nazis anymore. Although, as we've seen here on our Earth, that doesn't always stick. Back aboard the Enterprise, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy are having a chat, and they agree that John Gill, as brilliant as he was, drew the wrong conclusion from history. The Nazis weren't horrible just because their leaders were deranged murderers, although they were, Kirk is quick to confirm, Rather, the real problem was the totalitarian nature of the Nazi state. You can't run such a regime benignly. And, as McCoy points out, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And then Spock brings up the number of dictators there have been throughout Earth history, and he and McCoy have one of their pissy little arguments, so Kirk can break it up and be like, check off, get us out of here before these two kill each other. Because even the Nazi episode has to somehow end on a lighthearted note. You don't want it to be too depressing. You'll scare off the audience, and almost nobody's watching this shit to begin with. So, Patterns of Force isn't a great episode. Its message gets a bit muddled, especially near the end when Fuhrer Gill is like, my plan to have a non-evil Nazi regime was working fine until this one guy came in and ruined it. Although... I think Kirk, McCoy, and Spock's conversation in the final scene pushes back against that somewhat. But ultimately, I think the episode has something important to say. We need to remember our history, but we also need to learn the right lessons from that history. And one of those lessons is that you can't praise the efficiency of the Nazi regime and ignore its brutality because they were part of a single whole. The same state that made the trains run on time also used those trains to transport millions of people to their deaths. If you impose totalitarianism, it doesn't matter if you're doing it for the sake of order and efficiency. You're still treating people as though their individual rights and lives don't matter. And when you do that, the cruelty and brutality are inevitable. Like I said back toward the beginning, Star Trek the original series isn't the only show in the franchise to do parallel or duplicate Earth stories, depending on how loosely you define the concept. Star Trek The Next Generation had the Royale, where the crew of the Enterprise D discovers a 20th century Earth hotel, complete with a few hundred 20th century Earth people standing on the surface of a planet where no human should have been able to survive. They also visited planets like Rubicon 3 in the episode Justice, Angosia 3 in The Hunted, Rutia 4 in The High Ground, and Ventax 2 in Devil's Do, none of which are duplicate Earths exactly, but all of which are home to species that are outwardly indistinguishable from humans, living under very Earth-like conditions, both naturally and socially. Star Trek Enterprise has an episode in its third season, North Star, where the crew discovers an old west town in the middle of the Delphic Expanse, 50 light years from Earth. The producers wanted to create a show in the mold of the parallel Earth episodes of TOS, and because of that, North Star has a fun throwback feel to it. The franchise returned to the parallel Earth concept as recently as the second season of Star Trek Discovery in the episode New Eden. Following one of the red bursts that served as plot fuel for most of that season, the crew uses the spore drive to jump to a planet in a remote region of the galaxy where they find a population of humans living in a pre-electric agricultural community. The human society of New Eden is inexplicable at first, but it is explained eventually, and not by Hodgkin's law. 
The explanation has to do with the Red Angel and ties in with the larger plot of the season, so I'm fine with it. But I am kind of bummed that the days of Star Trek crews randomly finding planets that are exactly like Earth, except for one thematically crucial difference, are apparently behind us. Nowadays, parallel Earths all gotta come with a plausible-sounding scientific reason for there being, I guess, an explanation like, I don't know, it just got that way. Doesn't cut any ice with these sophisticated youngsters making the new Star Trek. But personally, I think it's the ideal explanation for a concept so wonderfully silly. In my research for this video, I also found that there's a novel in the Department of Temporal Investigation series that offers explanations other than improbable parallel development for the duplicate Earths we see in Miri and the Omega Glory. According to the novel, Earth 2 from Miri is actually an Earth from a parallel universe that was swapped into the Prime Universe through some subspace, what you who's it, and by the post-TNG era it had been swapped back to its original universe. And the American flag, constitution, and other fragments of United States history and culture treasured by the Yangs on Omega-4 were explained as products of cultural contamination, and Earthship dropped them off during a visit to Omega-4 in the 22nd century. I haven't read the book. For all I know, it's quite good. I will merely suggest that if my fellow Trekkies who have spent the last few decades trying to retcon the oddball details of TOS to make it more consistent with the rest of the franchise had directed that energy towards something productive, we'd have permanent colonies on the moon and Mars by now. The main reason why parallel Earth stories are so popular in Star Trek is because they're cheaper to do. You can shoot on already standing sets on the back lot, you can use pre-existing costumes. Gene Roddenberry even included this in his pitch to the network, explaining the parallel worlds concept makes production practical by permitting action-adventure science fiction at a practical budget figure via the use of available Earth casting sets, locations, costuming, and so on. That being the case, not every parallel Earth visited by the crew of the Enterprise is an editorial comment by the writers on our own society, but the more interesting ones are. The episode set on the gangster planet is more or less a romp, but Kirk and Spock don't beam down to a planet with its own version of the Third Reich just so they can have a reasonably budgeted adventure where they run around beating up Nazis, although that would have been fine with me. The episode has something to say about the importance of learning from history and the inherently harmful nature of authoritarianism. That message is delivered imperfectly, but as I said, it's still important. The Nazi planet isn't my pick for the worst parallel Earth just because it's the one that's run by Nazis, but also because it establishes that the Nazi regime on that world was founded with good intentions. John Gill didn't want to persecute anyone. He didn't want to wage wars of conquest and genocide. He wanted to establish unity and order. Through the example of the Nazi state of Echo, Star Trek shows us that sometimes the cost of unity and order is too high, and that our good intentions don't absolve us of our responsibilities. Those are lessons which, unfortunately, we need to keep relearning. With the worst parallel Earths, the point isn't so much that they're like our Earth, but that they're a little too much like it. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed this one. I'm gonna let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is gonna be, but before I do that, I wanna give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons. They are Phase Flux, thank you, Phase Flux. Jebs, thank you, Jebs. BA Teller, thank you, BA Teller. Guy Hoyle, thank you, Guy. Sukareva Syndrome, thank you, Sukareva Syndrome. Sorry and Brandy, thank you, Sorry and Brandy. Robert Lamarca, thank you, Robert. Austin Steiner, thank you, Austin. Paul Howell, thank you, Paul. And Trooper Bear and Triker, thank you, Trooper Bear and Triker. Next up, new channel members, and they are Oasis, thank you, Oasis. Eric William, thank you, Eric. 
B.A. Teller, thank you again, B.A. Teller. Eric Allen, thank you, Eric. Einsteiner 900, thank you, Einsteiner 900. And Virginia Mackey, thank you, Virginia. Those are the newest Patreon patrons to pledge $5 a month or more, and the newest channel members to join at the five bucks a month tier or higher. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash Steve Shives and pledging any amount from a dollar a month on up or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice monthly Ask Away live streams. Now, if you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon, or become a member at the five bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout out at the end of a Trek Actually video. I could not do this without the support of my patrons and my members. So to all of you who support this channel with a monthly contribution, thank you so much for enabling me to have this wonderful job. And once again, if you want to help out, please go to patreon.com slash Steve Shives or just click the join button below the video. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects, The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole. The three of us play characters who are low ranking Starfleet officers. We are into our fourth season now and our characters have jumped from the TOS era to the TNG era. Our show is a lot of fun to make, and judging by most of the comments we get, it's a lot of fun to listen to as well. If you're not listening, the links are in the description of this video. Please do check out the Ensign's Log. I think you'll really dig it. I also do a weekly watch-along live stream with Dana called Trek Reluctantly, where we watch episodes of Deep Space Nine, which Dana has never seen before, and until recently, we were watching Firefly which I had never seen before. Now that we're done with Firefly, we'll be watching other stuff of Dana's choice on alternating weeks with DS9. And this week, we're starting off with the first half of that modern classic directed by Steven Soderbergh and starring Channing Tatum, Magic Mike. So whenever you're able to join us, we invite you to queue up whatever we're watching on your end and watch along with us. It's every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. So if you're interested and able, please join us for Trek Reluctantly. We'd love to have you. Now, let's talk about the next episode of this series. Starfleet officers are usually presented as examples of the finest humanity has to offer. They're brave, they're honest, they're principled, and they're tough. Tough enough to bounce back from harrowing experiences that would result in severe long-term trauma for many of us. But is that toughness or assumption of toughness something Starfleet takes unfair advantage of? What about the times when Starfleet officers should have been given some time off following a particularly stressful adventure? What about the times when we've seen a Starfleet officer who was clearly traumatized, but was allowed to go back to work, leading to tragic results down the road? We're going to talk about all of that in next month's video, a topic which won the most recent poll and which was originally suggested to me by viewer Edwin Bish. Thanks, Edwin. And that topic is, is Starfleet actually negligent toward its officers? Looking forward to that one. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care of yourselves, and I will see you next time.